also uh, involved into farming. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what's your take on agribusiness and what it is that you do? Well, agribusiness, it's like the same thing that moved me into Econ Lighting Africa kind of moved me. I saw a need to get involved in agriculture because I don't believe any country or any continent can be, you know, developed without self-sufficiency of agriculture. We have a young population, the youngest in the world today. We have the sun, we have a flat land, 60% of the world's edible land, but we only produce 7% of the world's food. We cannot feed ourselves. Most of the things that we eat in Africa are transported from overseas, exported in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and etc. for the rice, in Ukraine, in the oil, vegetables here in Morocco. To me, the question that I asked myself was, what can be done to close the gap? And I always believe that the best way to, to protest, to be an activist, is to take actions. In the sense of, how can we, talking to myself now, take a step further, instead of just criticizing and blaming who didn't do the work. In my level, what can I do to make sure my house, personally, I'm self-sufficient first. And then my friends are self-sufficient, and then my community is self-sufficient. So then I invested in farming. I said, it's time to buy a land, and it's time to farm. I'm a social entrepreneur. I, I identify where the issues are, and I want the business that I do affect the lives of people because that's what moves me. I'm attached to Africa. I am attached to the needed change of my continent. And, and for that, I don't wait for no one to do it in my place. I don't look for government or private sector. They all have their, I think, enough in their plate. But for me, are the returning Senegalese who lived in the U.S. for 19, 20 years, I have an obligation also to contribute in the development of my country and my continent. And this, I don't wait. I just get dirty in the ground and to make things happen. And I think that's what moved me in the agricultural sector. And it's, it's wonderful because it changed my life in the process. Now I love farming. It's, it's allowing me to give access, give job, direct jobs to young people who thought they would never be a farmer, young lawyers, young accountants, young people who, when they saw me leaving the United States, Washington, D.C., where I could stay and enjoy life, and then I come to Senegal in the farms, getting dirty with them, and then not telling them go to farm, but farming with them. I think it gives a little inspiration. I hope that it's possible to make it in our own home. It's possible to drive the change we want to see in our own communities. Um, and I can't be more proud of what my team and I are doing um, to show that it's possible. How many jobs have you created? More than 100 young people, you know. And then we have small hotels that are attached to um, the farm with restaurants in the tourism industry, where in our restaurants, when you go to each hotel, it's from farm to table. And in the farm, I created what we call the farm share, Jefferson farm share, which means anybody from the diaspora can invest in farming from where they are with only $200 minimum investment and 10% guarantee every harvest time, every three or four month investing. For example, right now we have pepper, we have tomato, we have cabbage and etc. So every time we have this, you have 10% in your investment. And when we launch it, and yeah, we do all of that, all so vegetables. You, you send all the vegetables are part of your returns to your investors? Or you to investors, I know I give them 10% guarantee to their initial investment. So money, you mean? You yes. don't give 10% of the harvest? No, I give them 10% <laughs> to them of their money. <laughs> then it will be too much. Because I have fa the farmers are also entrepreneurs. I want them to make sure that they make money. Mm -hmm. When they come to the farm, I tell all of them, you all are entrepreneurs. Nobody's an employee here. You tell me what you need, I invest. We work together, we make the money, and on top of profit, we all split it. And, and this you gives them ownership. To, you're trying to 
trying to change the dynamic. The narrative. The narrative, but the dynamic. Of course, well. that is true. Um, what is the vision? What is the ambition? That is the vision. The vision is the narrative to be changed. In the long run, the vision is I want my people to, to not wait for anyone to feed them. Whoever feeds you control your destiny. And for too long, Africa waits for someone else to come and feed it. Africa waits for somebody else to, to change our own destiny. In that, we blame so many people. And there is a lot to be blamed. But I think we've come to a point now that there is a new generation of young Africans who, just like you, been to the top schools in the world, have traveled the world, have understood the world, can talk and communicate to the world. What I will say is that that new Africa is grown now. The baby is grown and can walk and run by itself. In Europe, where you're from, after the war, after the second war, this is not long ago, this is the late 40s, beginning of the 50s, we were better off in the 60s when we left independence than you were. You had no energy, sometimes no running water, no roads, everything was destroyed. But it took young Europeans, with the help of the German Marshall Fund, the Americans, to give you a little push to keep the train moving forward. But the difference between you in Europe and us is that Europe graduated from aid. Europe decided at one point that we don't need America anymore. We can do it on our own. That's what we call will, la volonté. Okay? And then they drive their own change. They reconstructed Europe. Us in Africa, since independence and now, we refuse to graduate from aid. We continue to beg for help. We continue to ask for someone else to come in our place, develop for our countries. We blame others for where we are. Again, there is people to be blamed, but that's, we shouldn't stop there. To me, it is time that we graduate from aid. It is time that we utilize our natural resources and the benefit of our own people. How can you explain 30% of wealth in the world is in Africa in natural resources, but yet we call one of the poorest continents in the world or the poorest? It is unacceptable. I don't accept it. We are not poor. We have poor leadership. We don't have, in many of our countries, the right leaders who work to serve the people for the benefit of the people. And that's what I look for, and that's what I work for, and that's what I think our generation needs, transformational leaders. The leaders such as Paul Kagame's, who will drive the change that their countries need, where you get everyone involved to one destiny, is to uplift the nation. And I think the time is there now, because Rwanda is, before I used to give examples of Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, the Emirates, and other countries. Today I'm proud to give examples of a country, a small country, with not enough natural resources, or almost no natural resources, a country that came out of atrocity just a few years ago, lost more than a million people, almost a million people, in a disastrous, unthinkable event. Or uh, today, in less than 30 years, in less than 20 years, is being an example of nation building in our own continent. We are very proud of what Rwanda is doing. And that should tell us it's all about the will. And in that, I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful to the future of Africa. Because we're here, the new generation. And we are conscious about what's laid in our shoulders and what needs to be done. That's why I left the United States and come home to do my part, not to blame anyone but me and what I should be doing every day to make that change. Morocco did it. Look at what Morocco are able to do. Morocco is able to be self-sufficient electricity. They don't need not a new aid. What they've built in the infrastructure, the leadership in this country is unbelievable what you see in Morocco in less than 30 years. 
if Morocco did it, we should be able to do it. Senegal mo have more than natural resources than Morocco. So we're talking 30 years? It should be less than 30 years. Okay, you're on. Give us the time frame. It's the, the time fr frame is the, the fierce urgency of now. I want it yesterday. I don't want it tomorrow or after tomorrow. I want the children of my country to have access to energy so they can compete with the young Americans in a few years in or tomorrow. I want that now. I want the people who are dying in our small hospital because a small you know, hospital bill of 5,000 francs, 10 euros, to stop. I want those women who are surrounded by five, six babies and not be able to feed them for one dollar a day to stop. I, I, I want to change that. I want for our countries to be the new El Dorado of the world, and it is. Everyone understands that Africa is the new El Dorado. The growth is in Africa. Opportunities are in Africa. That's why you have the Chinese in there. The United States is in there. Europeans are in there. The Turks is in there. Even Russia is coming to Africa. Japan and China are there. Everyone understands that the El Dorado of the world today is in Africa, but Africans. Yet we have millions of young people dying in the ocean here in the Mediterranean trying to cross to look for an opportunity in Europe. That is what's called fell leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.